I had wondered when we might meet, but I must say, I did not expect it to be with a trail of enemies behind you. Hello and welcome to session 15 of my Pillars of Eternity 2 Deadfire lore through. Uh, as you can see, well, maybe you can't see, but we are currently in Delver's Row. This is a hidden area where a lot of seedy goings on happen in uh, Nekataka. Last session, we spent, I think the entire time, maybe the beginning was a little bit, we, we came from Kahanga Palace, but after that, we basically spent our entire time in the different sections of Old City, which is an old ruin underneath Nekataka. Um, so yeah, we spent the entire time there, and we are currently in Delver's Row, which we had quite a few quests that asked us to find Delver's Row, so we're going to start to explore that today. But before we get there, I want to read from the uh, last two sections, actually, of the history of the guidebook. Um, not the history of the guidebook, the history of the dead fire in the guidebook. Um, so there are two fairly short sections here, and I think they're just kind of served to kind of get us up to date with what's happening at the beginning of this game. So uh, the first section is the hollowing of the Deerwood in 2823, so that was five years ago, and that was what was happening in the first game. And then the second section is 2828 AI, the Audra Colossus, so that is um, the Colossus that we have been following this entire game so far. So the first section, again, this is the hollowing of the Deerwood. Far north of the Deadfire, in the territory known as the Eastern Reach, an epidemic of incredible proportions swept across the former Adiran colony known as the Deerwood. Aethys, the god of light and rebirth, had taken mortal form to rally the zealots of Rayad Saris into forming an army. After his defeat and the subsequent destruction, a generation of Deerwood and children came into the world without souls. Scholars, priests, and animancers hotly debated whether Aethys was punishing citizens of the Deerwood in this hollowborn crisis or if his death had something inter had somehow interrupted the reincarnation cycle. How this crisis came to a close is something of a mystery, but evidence points to the intervention of a newcomer to the Deerwood, the master of Cadnua, and a watcher, one who sees between life and death and can commune with souls, who earned no small acclaim over the course of their travels. Shortly after this figure's arrival, the cycle of reincarnation resumed as normal, and children were once more born into the world alive and healthy. So yeah, like I said, I think this is just kind of get new players up to date, but not in a way that makes it that that makes it so that they wouldn't want to play the first game. It says nobody really knows what was going on with this Hollowborn crisis, but it probably had something to do with the Watcher, who was a new a newcomer in the Deerwood. Um, we know since we played the game that it was our actions that brought that about but it didn't really have anything to do with Aethys the Hollowborn crisis it was Wittica and her follower Theos who were activating these machines and um, taking the souls from the newborns and we were able to stop them from doing that uh, this next section 2828 AI the Audra Colossus Shortly after the Holoborn Crisis came to a close, the Keep of Cadnua had achieved an aura of order and peace, which came to replace the superstition and unease that pervaded the old estate for centuries. All of this came to a swift end when a colossal statue of Audra, 700 feet in height and as solid as a mountain, burst from under the ancient grounds, shattering the old keep and killing every member of the household. The giant of intricately engraved Audra marched toward the sea, making his way east with relentless determination. What he saw on the frontier of the archipelago was anyone's guess, but the mass exploitation of popularity of Luminous Adra left some to wonder if the events were in any way related. It is said that the master of Cadnua, who was... I'm sorry. It is said that the master of Cadnua was also killed during this unexpected uprising, though more recent reports of activity to the east have put that claim into question. So yeah, we, I guess, technically did die. The Watcher did die. But we um, start this game in the in-between, speaking with Barith, the god of death and, um, well, the god of death. And she told us what Aethys was doing, caught us up to date with that, and tasked us with finding him and seeing what his plan was. And that, so that gets us caught up with this game. Obviously, we're pretty deep into this playthrough right now. This is session 15, so um, we've got... A good amount behind us but 
uh, it's still kind of, I think, interesting to hear how these tales are being told in the guidebook, not as a way to tell us everything that happened in these two games, but to get us excited to figure out what's actually going to happen in this game as we play through them, and even the first game as well. Okay, so like I said, we are in Delver's Row. Um, I don't remember exactly which... Okay, so last session in the Overlook, we found, or uh, Undercroft, we found that people had been smuggling things in through this area. Pirates have been smuggling in, and Prince Arihi would like to know that. Um, just seeing what else has something to do with Delver's Row. I need Drowner's Lung Medicine here. Drowner's Lung is a kind of epidemic in the gullet of Nekataka. Uh, we also want to establish a source of food somehow. Uh, Enoi asked me to help reestablish a source of food for the Raparu. Perhaps I could ask Prince Arihi in Kahanga Palace or the Dawn Stars in the Sacred Stair. Or I could find a way to speak with Mad Morena, Ulog's contact among the Principe in the Undercroft. I think I killed her. They just all attacked me, so they didn't even give me a choice to talk to them. Um, so I think we're going to go... Maybe we'll talk to the Dawn Stars and Sacred Stair for this, or we'll talk to Prince Arihi. Okay... Search Dilver's Rose for signs of Jockalo. Also, this is Palagina side quest. We're looking for Jockalo. And that looks like it for down here. So let's uh, start exploring. Let's see what these people have to say. Get him. Whoa. Okay, so I just got attacked. I hope I don't have to lay waste to the entire Delver's Row. I'm alright. Currency closed, nothing too special there. Sure thing. Wet salty air and, and, and uh, wet salty air and echoing voices rise from below. I'm gonna steal anything here. Still hoping that I don't have to carve my way through the denizens of Delver's Row. There is a uh, recently dead person in their spirit. The body of this moon godlike woman is contorted into a death spasm. Her mouth is open, milky eyes staring, frozen in shock. Dressed in Principe leathers, she appears to have been a pirate. A small, intricate bronze and odd device lies next to her, cracked and blackened. Her soul lingers by. Even without reaching out to it, you can sense her confusion. So it's a moon godlike, so I believe that that is Andra. It's a pirate. I wonder if this has something to do with Jackalo. Let's see. The captain said to bring him, so you're bringing him. The old man hardly seems like a threat, but you trust the captain's judgment. The Animancer didn't want to go, put up as much of a fight as he could. Nodra said to give him a whack, so you gave him a whack. That shut him up. But carrying the old sack of bones is tiring. Just need to get him on the ship, and you can get some rest. You're in Delver's Row, passing through the market when he starts to come. He's not strong enough to break free. Still, you don't think the wiry old Animancer could squirm so much. Per complanca, per complanca net. 
He yells to no one in particular. It's Delver's Row, so no one particularly cares. Uh, so the tooltips here, Delver's Row is somewhere be beneath the gullet, is a loose confederation of thugs, thieves, black marketeers, and other seedy individuals known as Delver's Row. It's a place where most things can be found for the right price, and word always travels quickly. And then per compranca means for mercy or for little mercy. So I'm, I'm going to guess this is Jacolo, who that she has in this sack here. Ahead of you. Yep. Ahead of you. Nodders calling out for the old man to shut up. You'll have time enough to plead for mercy, Captain Ta from Captain Tatsaddle, once we get to Dunnage. The Death, Gu the Death God Light's twin sister nods to you. You get the message. It's time for the Animancer to go back to sleep. Dunnage, I believe, is where the Prince Beast and Petrena have their kind of headquarters. You remove a hand from the old man to grab your club. He's weak, but the squirming is irritating. Wait, what's that odd little thing in his hand? I'll take that if you don't mind, and especially if you do. You laugh to yourself as you reach for it. The old man starts to stammer. No. There's a flash and a powerful stench like brimstone and a sharp pain. Sharp, but quickly gone. No matter. Nodder and Nodra have been already knocked have already knocked the old man out. You move to help carry him, but can't seem to get your arms up. The twins are looking at something on the ground. You've always hated how you can't see their eyes. Captain says not to judge them. After all, would you want to be judged for how you look? Certainly not, Captain. Good point as always, Captain. You follow where their hands, where their heads are pointing. That's you on the ground. Mouth open. Eyes open. That weird little device smoldering next to your hand. It can't be right, though. You're here. The twins turn to go. They motion to the others to hurry along. You'll catch up. You just need to figure out how to move your arms. So this person died and didn't realize they died. What is it? What did you see? A group of godlike pirates took Jacolo to Dunwich. Madiko. Jacolo abducted by godlike pirates. But why? He has always done his best to help my kind. Watcher, I have asked much of you already. But if you can find time to go to Dunwich to find this Captain Tatsaddle, it would mean a great deal to me. It did not sound as though he was in imminent danger. But I fear what they will do to him. Seems like Animancers aren't safe anywhere. They are in the Republics. Even when Jocolo was not in someone's good graces, he was never in danger. Something strange is going on here. Perhaps it has something to do with his research. I am sure we will find out when we find Captain Tatzatl. Swinging her lantern softly, Shodi lures the soul into its depths. His lips curl and clear distaste. This grizzled old Amao woman looks like she's been left in the sun to dry. Her skin is so worn and weathered it's hard to tell her wrinkles from her scars. Be welcome, stranger. I've heard your name whispered in the streets of the black market. We are Delver's Row criminals. Um, well, we have a bad reputation with Delver's Row criminals. That makes sense. You need a blade or a bludgeon or some sturdy armor. Umani has what you seek. The old woman gives you a grin that multiplies the wrinkles on her face. What happened to the godlike in the alley? Some sort of scuffle between a lone fellow and a pack of godlike pirates. The lone man didn't look like much of a fighter, but he proved old Umani wrong. She nods towards the body and cackles. The pirates were taking him toward the lift to the Undercroft. They must have spoken with the guard there. Perhaps he could say more. She points across the alley. I'm looking for medicine to cure Drowner's Lung. Then you blunt your teeth talking to me. Go and see Ernezzo. His shop is just across the way. She points to the door across the tunnel. Show me what you got. Old Umani's stock is tested in the hands and throats of the fiercest sorts in the gullet. But you already know that, Akira. She winks. Okay, a couple of unique things here. We have a unique helmet. Grants immortal will. 
which means that I can't be interrupted. The wearer is immune to interrupts while they carry one or more injuries. Oh. This helmet once belonged to a Hawana barbarian known throughout the archipelago as Rekvu, dread of invaders. Local legends hold that Rekvu appeared only when her force's situation was at its most dire. Rekvu often sustained injuries in battle that would have killed any other warrior, and yet she never died. Near the end of her life, Rekvu was pulled into battle once again, this time against a horde of Jotun, unleashed on a quiet mining village by an opportunistic noble from a distant nation. It, in Jotun, wielding a monstrous greatsword, caught Rekvu unawares in the thick of the fighting and slammed her blade into Rekvu's head. Rekvu dashed the blood from her eyes and leapt on the Jotun, knocking him to the ground. With one great swing of her axe, Rekvu severed both of the Jotun's heads. When the remaining Jotuns were slain and invading nobles' bodies were quartered and given to the sea, Rekvu dashed the blood from her eyes and pulled off her cracked helmet, only to discover that the Jotun's attack had cleaved her ear clean off. Oh. And then we have the Undying Burden, a unique belt. Gives you plus one athletics, second wind, which gives you, uh, which you can use once per rest to uh, get more health. Uh, grit incoming damage is reduced as health is lost, and plus two constitution. The Deer Wooden Commander Maxail Hessian wore this belt during the Battle of the Mid March Road, one of the opening clashes of the War of Defiance. The War of Defiance is where the Deer Woodens gained independence from the Adir Empire. The Deer Woodens fought valiantly, but their disorganized light infantry was no match for the Adiran Heavy Regiment. Overwhelmed, the rebels were killed nearly to a man. According to several Adiran soldiers, Maxail uh, was the last to fall. Surrounded and badly wounded, he refused the Adiran commander's offer for quarter. It took a dozen spears to put the rebel down, and even then he continued to fight until he was beheaded. Gauntlets of Reliability, stamped with the sigil of Abaddon, these cleverly crafted gloves feature fully articulated joints. The weight of the arm guard seems specifically designed to help counterbalance that of a weapon. Gives 15% um, of misses are converted to graces with proficient weapons. And everything else is just fine weapons and armor. Okay. Stray dog here. Algol. Algol gives us minus 20% constitution affliction duration. So whenever we are afflicted with something that affects our constitution, it doesn't last as long. I hear footsteps. Something approaches. Hmm. The spindle man. Said Vithrock. Have a couple ogres here, it looks like. A cloaked elf and a spiderling. Mm. Hmm. Something hidden in the bookshelf here. What is this kith creature? The Vithrak cocks its head and focuses as many eyes on you. Its strange companions also stare at you with unnatural intensity. Um, this is not in quotes, this is italicized, suggesting that um, he's speaking to us telepathically. Ugh, it's making my skin crawl. What secrets does it bring? You feel a gentle scratching in your head. Another voice speaks directly into your mind. Let us see. Let us see. The Vithra clicks its claws together in delight. Oh, should I s shield my mind? I can do that as a cipher. Or I should just be honest and say, go ahead, I've got nothing to hide. Not shield my mind. The Vithrak withdraws, grinding one of the mandibles peevishly. We wish to only see, to know, yet Kith hide and hoard their secrets. I don't trust this creature at all. He eyes the Vithrak and looks toward the exit. The creature's probing psyche traces a question in your mind. Its strange companions stand perfectly still, waiting. Will you tell me a secret? It snaps its mouth parts together in irritation. Not when you have been such a miser with your own. Fine, I'll tell you a secret. I assume you're volunteering one of your own. He coughs delicately. Yes. Uh, 
Um, so I, I think I'm going to say the second one, but I just wanted to point out this. I'm not really left-handed here. I'm sure that's a uh, slight nod to Princess Bride and um, the Dread Pirate Roberts <laughs> and Inigo Montoya, who get in a fight both with their left hands until they both say they're not really left-handed. Um, okay, I'm going to say I was nearly killed by Aethys and restored by Bareth. It stops and considers, one fang trembling. You feel it tasting your thoughts for the truth. Yes. You have been generous with us. The ogre nods slowly. Oh, the ogres nod slowly, I was going to say. So that's the cloak elf that said that, and the ogres both um, agreed. You know of the place below the slums. There was another, more distant place beneath the sea. There lies a secret so grand that even the gods hide it. To find such a thing, how marvelous. Let's see if he'll tell me a secret. It snaps his mouth parts together in irritation. Not when you have been such a miser with your own. Oh, I just told him a secret though. Uh, what are you doing in the gullet? We dig. There are many mines here with many secrets, many depths with even more. A city under a city. Another in the ruins. It teems with young secrets, rivalries, and betrayals. We seek the older secrets, buried deeper and carved on weathered stone. So, all right, so I'm going to see if I can Not, yes. tell him a different secret. Let's see. The gods were created by the Anguithans. That's something we learned about in the first game. It stops and considers one thing trembling. You feel it tasting your thoughts for the truth. Yes. You have been generous with us. This is the same thing that happened before. You know of the place below the slums. Right. There lies a secret not when you have okay so maybe i need to find a different secret <laughs> okay so this is his uh inventory we can buy his grimoire this is sisypho's stone which is a necklace minus two percent action speed and damage to attacker for 15 seconds when the wearer is hit in melee as punishment for his crimes the mage and mass murderer sisypho was condemned by the committee of upright study committee of upright study haven't heard of them before, but spared execution due to the unfavorable political repercussions. Instead, he was imprisoned and sentenced to endlessly levitate a large stone above his head, while alchemical potions eliminated the need for food, drink, or sleep. While the levitation demanded nothing from Sisypho physically, it was mentally exhausting. After many years of torment, Sisypho's sister, the insane wizard Lycaila, Lysila, Lysila, don't know how to pronounce that. Stormed the prison and set her brother free by driving the mythic wedge of whiffed into the stone and shattering it. She and Sisypho escaped to continue their mad reign of terror and destruction, but not before collecting a shard of the stone. This amulet was made from that shard. Okay. Mortification boundings. These are the wrappings of a monk. They're interwoven with shards of bone and bits of glass, which cause great pain to the wearer, elevating mind and body. Reminds me of Zawa. A companion from the White March expansion. Oh, no, I don't want that. We have Zandethis' dragon scaled grimoire. Wow. This is expensive. This must have some really great spells in it. Bunch of scrolls. Special there. Obsidian lamp figurine. Summons three shades. These mortification bindings, I really wanted to see what. So, monk. So, mortification must be um, the monk's injuries or something like that. And as they get their injuries, they're able to use their special uh, skills. So, that must be what that is. Then we have a ring of regeneration. Nothing special, but the White Witch Mask, is there something here? Yes. Grants 
Rhyngrim's repulsive visage, the caster becomes a nightmarish mask of rotting, insect-infested flesh or other images of unspeakable horror, compelling all nearby foes to become terrified and sickened. And it also grants us Rhyngrim's enervating terror, causes enemies in the area of effect to envision their worst fears, leaving them weakened and terrified and gives us our illusion power levels plus one. This is said to be the mass of Basajujak, an evil Dalempugra of Nasatak myth. According to the legend, she would often lure children from the safety of their villages into the woods. There, she would confound their minds, causing them to become lost and frightened. As her victims wandered further into her domain, Basaj Basajujak would fill their hearts with an ever-increasing dread. Eventually, she would reveal herself, her terrible face concealed beneath a mask made of leaves, spark, and other dying things. When the child, terrified beyond sanity, could endure no more, Basajujak would lower her mask, revealing her true visage. Her victims, it is said, then died of fright. So like a Nasatak fable there, except it's not just a fable. This person actually existed. Um, and this story kind of reminds me of the Baba Yaga. There might be something that fits more aptly with that one, though. Okay, that's everything that the Spindle Man has. Um, I'll uh, trade some of my things, too. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's where the Ring of Regeneration is. It's tucked in a book. The archer's way back there. Hmm. Maybe that's why I couldn't get a secret from him. Let's see. Although those things happen to be archer, I doubt. Not. Yes. Uh, nope. <clears throat> Our buyer in Defiance Bay needs another shipment of Sviv. Not so loudly, but send it at once. Is it, Arnetzo is the one who, um, Imani, is that, I forget her name, uh, told us would have the cure for the drowner's lung. So let's see if he's willing to give it to us. Arnetzo has not seen you before. You must be new. New or very good at disguises. <laughs> The man chuckles. He peers at you through his half-moon spectacles. His face is hidden behind a thick but well-groomed beard, and his eyes constantly dart between you and the doorway. Wait, but I am mistaken. You have made a few enemies in this place already, no? Most bold of you to linger now. But how did you hear about this place? Wait, no. Do not tell me. Sometimes it is better not to know. There is something I can get for you, yes? Tell me quietly. What do you know about the spindle man? Merla, it is a dangerous pest. He crosses his arms and shoulders and shudders. When it dug its lair, it did not even ask permission of their... Uh, <clears throat> of the boss. Forget the name of the boss. Der Dervo, maybe? And usually you want to pay the proper respects if you're digging a lair. Is that all? He shakes his head. They say it is a mind reader. We in Delves Row are simple folk. Quiet folk. It does not do to have a mind reader nosing among us. You understand me, yes? He inclines his head toward you. I could see why the people down here wouldn't like that. I need medicine for Drowner's Long. Eh? I hope you are not ill. But never mind. If the Mataru come asking, I will not tell. He winks and taps his lower lip, backing away from you just a little. But Drowner's lung is very serious, very deadly. He clucks and shakes his head. The cure is not cheap, but how can one put a price on good health? He grins marvelously and waggles eight fingers on the couch top before you. On the other hand, you strike me as someone with a certain reputation. Not that I would ever be discreet. <laughs> if the price seems high, there is a certain little favor you could do for me instead. What's the little favor? Just mind that you keep this between us. You have a reputation for being too... candid. 
There is a certain merchant here who needs to not be here. He draws a finger across his throat. I'm Miko. You are as subtle as a church bell. <laughs> And what would a paladin of the Brotherhood know of subtlety, huh? He waves a hand at her and turns back to you. So, do you follow? He taps his fingers together. All right, let's see what he has to say about this. This merchant runs a shop at the end of the street. People know it as the Spindle Man. Mm. If you get rid of it, then I will give you the medicine. He nods, his spectacles flashing in the candlelight. Hold on, not so fast. Do they call him that because he carries a spindle, or because he's got spindly legs? So, some of these comments would make more sense if we hadn't already met him. I'm just going to pay him the 800. I don't want to go and kill the spindle man. Belfetto. Though, if your coin purse is so full, take care that others do not hear it jingle. He winks. Your medicine, as promised. He shakes your hand, and you feel a glass file slip into your palm. He gives you a nod of acknowledgement. Hey, how did you do that? Can you do that again? What are you still? Oh, he just slipped it to me. So we got Drowner's Lung Medicine. The bottle holds an unappealing brown sludge, but it's a cure for a deadly disease known as the Drowner's Lung. A sharp, piney odor leaks past the cork. Bless his heart if his strength and good looks ever go. Ernesto blinks slowly at Adair before turning back to you. There is something I can get for you, yes? Tell me quietly. He leans in. I need supplies. Of course. Only do not tell anyone where you got them. I have unique light armor. Legendary. How much is this? 35 grand. Yeah. It's a lot. Though now extinct, oh, this is called Garari Curas. Though now extinct, the giant lizards known as Garari once roamed the many islands of the Dead Fire. They were fast, powerful, and cunning predators, hated amongst Kith for their tendency to kill domestic goats and pigs if given half a chance. When foreign colonists arrived in the archipelago, many local governors placed an open bounty on any Garari, and the creatures were soon hunted to oblivion. Now, rare due to a lack of available material, hardened Garari leather armor such as this is quite desirable as it is tough and naturally flexible. I wonder if we'll meet any Garari in, uh, in Avowed. The Red Hand, a unique arquebus. The young brigand who once wielded the arquebus had not intended to become a murderer. Those he threatened down the twin barrels had a simple choice. All they had to do was hand over their valuables and go on their way. The gun was intimidating enough. No, no one was supposed to get hurt. When an old Amawa priest decided to fight back, the brigand acted on instinct and pulled the trigger. It took two shots to put the fool down. The killing got easier after that. In fact, it became the rule rather than the exception. Searching corpses was simpler than robbery and just as lucrative. He kept the gun with him at all times, even while he slept. His dreams were filled with morbid parade of those he had killed. Over the years, he found his heart hardened. He could feel nothing, not even regret. Unable to reconcile the young man had been he had been with the jaded monster had become the brigand, numb and resigned, used the gun to take his own life. It's a grim story. Okay. So that's it for Ernesto. We got the drowner's lung. Um, like so much people who have cures for things, they use that as a price to put a premium on something rather than, you know try to be helpful um famous like drug companies and stuff like that obviously put things at a premium um and that hurts people who actually need those things and don't have the money to afford it several paintings look identical down to the signatures copied in the corners furtive whispers and footsteps rise from the lower street oh that's a street huh for some reason, I thought that that was water there. That mist was water. I have nothing for the likes of you. Nobody wants to sell to us. Let's see. Did it get a little bit better? Oh, 
we have minus five um, Principe on Petrena, minus three Delvis Row Criminals. Yeah, they don't like us very much. I'm guessing it's because we killed everybody that was in the Undercroft last session. This is Enerot. An Orlin woman stands over a table laden with herbs and spices. She mixes them without looking at her work, pausing now and then to raise a sprig or file to her nose. You realize she is blind. Yours is a gate I recognize, watcher. Best watch your step. It's the smell of cardamom that drew you, no? Or perhaps the sting of fresh pepper. Or maybe you seek something with a stronger bite. She swivels her ears, but her cloudy eyes do not find you. What do you sell? Food, of course, and supplies for the road. Though most here come to me for poisons and venoms. You need supplies. I have plenty. Though, if you're buying poison and ailment, mind you store them separate. Got some Delver's stew, plus 10 max health. Even she's got some armor here. It's always good to have a extra rope and grappling hook, flint and tinder, and pry bar. Here's in the stash. out. Figure in the shadows looks up at your approach, pursing his lips together in a crooked line. Think you made a wrong turn, Bilger. You don't belong in the row. The name's Biarter. I know who you are. I make it my bag to keep my eyes on the new fish that end up in the gullet. Rats round here been whispering about you. Is that because I'm shady? Why am I shady? I'm guessing you're looking to buy some art, yeah? He lightly traces a finger across the hilt of an emerald-encrusted stiletto hidden within the folds of a dark leather tunic. His narrowed eyes seem to dance in the magical light as the gemstone pulses with a caustic glow. The right half of his mouth sends menacingly as he dips his head and peers at you from underneath his brow. You're an assassin. You're answered with a thin-lipped scowl as your words echo throughout the city. Assassins are nothing but cowards. Careful, Bilger. That kind of talk has gotten scabs rougher than you, dead drunk with their own blood, eh? With a shrug, he leans back against the wall. Does that mean he's gonna attack me if I go past him? I'm gonna see, but I don't, I don't want to get attacked by him, so I'm just gonna go and see what happens. Ah, it doesn't matter. The alley narrows to a dead end. Okay. So, one of the options was to hire him. Is this everything? Dario, that's the name of the leader down here. I guess we can't actually see him right now. There was a locked door in Ernetzo's shop. But I don't think that would go over well, especially since there's guards at the door. If we go out this way, we'll have to go through the. Um, there's like a scripted interaction choices that you can uh, go through to get here if you don't go through Old City. Yeah. You leave the hustle of Delver's Row behind you and fade into the alleys. 
You peer through the curtain at the tunnel beyond. It continues to the left and the right. Go left. The tunnel opens to your right. Rats squeak and skitter away at your approach, the way before you corkscrews into the darkness. Go forward. You make your way forward, feeling the walls to guide yourself in the darkness. Your hands come away slimy. You smell something foul further down the tunnel, the sense of loosed bowels and the metallic tang of blood. At the end of the tunnel, you find a body slumped against a wall. Stab wounds rend the corpse's clothes and flesh, and its arms and knees twist at the unnatural ledges. Search the body. Success, you find a secret compartment sewn into the lining of his trousers. It contains a small note and a handful of coins. 100 copper, read the note. Ulog, there's a new shipment for your Oparo friends waiting near the lift in Delver's Row. Come get the food before this cave stink rots it. Your mad Captain Morena. P.S. Give the old man my regards. I put an extra kawiki in there just for him. P.P.S. Don't say I ain't, I never done anything nice. Game dead man's note. Turn around. Um, I guess we'll go left this time. Oh, and that leads out. Actually. Save. Try again. Um, go left. Go right. The stone floor is littered with flesh and bones and bread and crusts and stamped with fo footprints in all shapes and sizes. Voices echo down the passage ahead of you. Go forward. The passage opens into a large cavern. Below you, ramshackle buildings crowd together like broken teeth. A maze of streets winds between them, some barely wide enough for two to pass abreast, and yet throngs of people fill the narrow streets and tiny plazas, their voices rising with the smoke of hundreds of torches. Explore the neighborhood. You pick your way down the worn, uneven stairs and descend into the hubbub below. Huana men, women, and children surround you, all laughing, haggling, quarreling over one another. You notice a few foreign faces, Valians, Adirans, and even a few Rawatayans slipped slipping through the crowd. A heady mixture of frying fish, unwashed bodies, and accumulated refuse permeates the air. You come across a Reparo man and woman sitting on a rooftop watching the activity below. They're passing a pipe back and forth and talking quietly. He gnaws the end of the pipe nervously. My neighbor disappeared near the Undercroft weeks ago. She shrugs. Always smugglers and pirates lurking there. Some of them turn to slaving. He nods, taking a puff. That's... For what I stay away from Del that's for what I stay away from Delver's Row. Plenty of bad sorts there. She holds her hand out for the pipe. Akira, but they are the only sorts you pay. They lapse into silence, smoking peacefully. Continue exploring the neighborhood. I thought this was part of Delver's Row, but apparently it's not. You find yourself in the middle of a shop lined street, packed shoulder to shoulder with people around you. You can barely move. Partial success. A passerby brushes against you, but you feel a hand reach for your purse. But you are faster. You snatch an arrow wrist and pull the would-be thief toward you. It's because of my sleight of hand. No, it's only oh, streetwise. So I didn't pass the streetwise. I did pass the sleight of hand check. Before you is a Huana child. Her eyes wide with terror. Let the child go. She rubs her wrist, backing away from you. At last, she takes off, darting under and past the long legs of adults. The child disappears among the crowd. I don't think I can continue exploring. Yeah. It's that same... Oh, wait, this isn't... I thought it was the same conversation. He takes a long draw on the pipe. He thought ab more about the offer. She scrapes a pattern in the grit. Sneaking luminous dust for a Principe man? Better than pushing Rautai cannons, I say. He blows a long stream of smoke through his nose. My cousin went to mu went to muscle for him. Says he pays well and pays fast. She picks dirt from under her nails. Best work in the gullet, as long as the Mataro and their trader friends don't notice. They lapse into silence, smoking peacefully. Continue exploring. You pass by a stall where a man serves murk brew. It's like coffee and chipped shells. A rich, nutty aroma rises in the plumes of steam. You hear a g gasp of surprise behind you and see a small group of people huddled together, chattering. Listen in. An elderly man shakes his head. Any with eyes can see they do not build ports for our, for our sake, yet the queen allowed their fort in the city. 
talking, I'm assuming, of the Royal Dead Fire Company here. The woman next to him clucks, clucks, Akara, the place is so high, even her head is in the clouds. Another man shrugs, at least the Rauatians will drive the other foreigners away. They make too much trouble for the other tribes, then they flee and crowd us here. The others murmur in agreement. Before you can hear more, the teeming masses sweep you further down the street. Continue to explore the neighborhood. You come across a Raparo man and woman sitting on a rooftop watching the activity below. They're passing a pipe back and forth and talking quietly. She puffs in the pipe. Found half a silverfin in the heap yesterday, still with the head. He shakes his head. The mirror's winds blow sweet for you. She sighs, breathing her head in smoke. No winds down here. You gotta dig. Always the good stuff gets buried by scraps, Akara. They lapse in silence, smoking peacefully. So these are all just conversations we can hear. Nothing of relevance catches your attention this time. Okay. Oh. You come across a corner where a pair of thugs, a man and a woman, have surrounded a Huan, a man. He has a pot belly and nervous expression, and he's backed himself as far into a corner as he can. The thugs advance. It's an exchange. You pay us, and we don't hurt you. Um... I'm just going to say leave him alone. Maybe I'll do this, actually. This isn't worth it. How much are you really going to make off a few poor Reparo? The thugs consider your words and nod. He's right. Let's head to the surface. Plenty of money floating around the bathhouse. The Huana man thanks you and nervously scurries off. Continue exploring the neighborhood. Pass by a busy stall where a man serves Merc Brew. Nothing of relevance. Nothing of relevance. Okay, so I think we're done here. Return to the Narrows. You trek back toward the tunnels, leaving the cavern behind you. Uh, go forward. Rats flee your path as you trudge back down the tunnel. You reach an intersection that continues to your left and right. Um, I think right is where we went last time, so go left. On your right is an abandoned merchant stall displaying cheap jewelry. Inspect the merchant stall. Laid out are various trinkets made from junk, necklaces strung with fish bones and shoe buckles, and bracelets made with shards of broken glass, but the curtain sways and flaps as if stirred by a draft. You twitch it aside and discover a secret passageway. On your left is an abandoned merchant stall displaying cheap jewelry. Go through the curtain behind the merchant stall. You check the tunnel one more time to make sure no one's watching, then you slip behind the curtain and into another passageway. You're walking along when several hooded figures materialize out of the darkness. Not so fast, you gotta pay a toll if you want to visit Delver's Row. Um. Good folk, open markets are vital to a healthy economy. Would you turn away a paying customer? They look at each other and shrug. I don't think I'm really good at bluffing. Just this once. I'll pay him 50. It's not much. The guards in the tunnel nod and let you through. You continue on, and the rough stone changes to smooth cobbles under your feet. One lamplight shivers ahead, as yellow and tremulous as fear itself. Before you is a narrow cavern that rises with shadows and echoes in the music of jingling coins. Oh, so this brought me right back to Delver's Row. Okay. Let's see, go right, go left, the tunnel branches to the left, the floor around the entrance is spattered with something as thick and dark as tar, it looks like speth. Go left, a handful of guards emerge and block your way, crossing their thick arms across your chests. One of them spits a vicious black, a viscous black glob at your feet, he rolls a dark plug between his teeth. Better head back, friend, it's invitation only passed here. I'm going to turn around. just want to get back to the gullet. <laughs> okay. How do I get back to the gullet? Mate.
You come to a door. It's as solid as the stone around it, with no handle and no knob. It's deathly quiet on the other side. You rap gently on the door, and the sound echoes as if in a wide, empty space. Darn it. Just want to get back to the gullet. Ugh. There we go. You come upon a weathered skiff, pink peeling. It rocks languidly in the water. It can row to Queen's birth. Silent as a becalmed sea, you row through the narrow cavern into Nakataka's Bay, making your way to Queen's birth. Okay. Phew. Let's go rest. Got a lot of injuries. Private room purely for the buffs. Now, what can I do? You see anything you like? Adventure over. Okay, bit of a disclaimer here. Uh, since last time I played, I have actually just returned from a two-week trip to Korea. Uh, it was amazing, but that's not why I'm telling you that. I'm telling you that because I was trying before I left to get together an episode and get it like ready to post while I was away, so I didn't have such a long gap in between the two episodes, uh, but I ran out of time and I wasn't able to do that. So what I played before in this session was before I left for the trip and now it's after I left for the trip. So I may forget some things that I did at the beginning of the session. Uh, so just keep that in mind as you're watching this, that there is like a three week gap between when I last played the first hour of this session and this last part of the session. Okay. Uh, that said, I did look at my journal really quickly just to uh, kind of hopefully catch myself up to speed. I know that I have to speak with, is it Kali Kelly in here about Oswalt? Uh, and then I want to go down to the gullet to give Enoi, I believe. No, it was the Dawnstar Priestess. I forget her name. The Drowner's Long Medicine. And then I have to speak with Prince Arihi in Serpent's Crown. So let's find Kelly in here. Or Kali. Of course. Maybe it's Khan. <clears throat> Have you got any leads on that mad old goat yet? I found Oswald. And? Where is he? Did you get my money? Funny thing, but Oswald's fat flat broke. Not a copper to his name. That twisty old pig licker. I should have known. Khan slams her fist on the table. The utensils jump. She looks away quickly. Tears just budding on her eyelashes, and dashes them away with a shuddering sigh. After the brief storm of emotion has passed, she steadies herself and turns hard eyes on you. Gods, but I'm dead tired of this wretched archipelago. She exhales a deep sigh. So, if you don't mind, I'll be taking my leave. May Wall's legion of creepy eyes watch your back and all that. Khan gives you a curt nod and finishes the remainder of her drink with a gulp. She hustles out of the tavern without so much as a wave goodbye. Hmm. I wonder what she was sad about. I don't remember enough of that story. Okay. All right, to the gullet.
start at the sanctuary. Pitley, that's where I have to go. You're wandering through the streets when a man approaches you, cutting through the crowd. You've never seen him, but the look in his eyes suggests that he recognizes you. Watcher, let me through. A meadow folk man emerges from the crowd, red-faced and wild-haired. He pays no mind to the irritated pedestrians glowering at him. His bright eyes are fixed on you. You're looking fervent, as always, Latharn. Cody juts her chin in a brusque greeting. In response, the missionary puffs out a breath. Suppose that was a compliment coming from you. Indeed, I strive to follow the light and godliness. Of course it was. I mean, why wouldn't it be? Shodi's words speak to innocence, but her grin is too rough, too wolfish. Then allow me to return the gesture. I'd say you seem darker than usual, Harvester. It shrouds you, all that death and hearsay. Reckon I'll hold my tongue from now on. Shodi immediately bristles. Ignoring her hard scowl, Latharn resettles his gaze on you. You. You're the one that saw the miracle when Aethys rose at Cadnua. Awe and conviction quiver in his voice. And you must be a Latharn. You looked to Sango just before Aethys arrived. I knew it. Our paths were meant to cross. Our people talk highly of you. It's no wonder Aethys chose you to witness his return. That's why I'm hoping you can help. The tiniest flicker of doubt dances across his face. He banishes it with a deep breath and launches into his tail. I've been having strange dreams. A wheel that spins and spins. An orchard, an orchard of queaky trees, each grown from the fallen fruit of the last. He scratches at his whiskered chin. Then, the spokes of the wheel break apart. The trees stop growing. Fruit falls and rots until the ground is covered with festering, stinking pulp. Dreams of the sleeping mind at play. No sense in getting worked up. Please, this is important, he frowns. In these dreams, I also see you at the center of the wheel in the middle of the orchard. You were there when Aethys rose, and you seem to follow everyone every place he's been. He works his mouth into a fretful pout as he gets to the crux of his concerns. Aethys has always meant rebirth and redemption. But so much death follows in his wake, both in the Saints' War and now here, again. His wide eyes are full of questions. Huh, is this what I sound like? Adair gives you a guilty grimace. He turns toward Latharn. Friend, I'd love to buy you a drink if it'd help. He shakes his head, the anxiety mount mounting behind his eyes. I need to know what this means. Please. Um, I do kind of want to say this, but... That kind of gives uh, this death and rebirth are part of the same cycle. You can't have one without the other. That gives Aethys a pass. Um, and even though that is true, I don't think that's an excuse for what Aethys is doing. So I'm going to say he's caused a lot of suffering. He makes a face as though he's working at something stuck in his teeth. My people follow Aethys to war once. Excuse me. I wonder sometimes if we failed him when we lost, or if we did, that the moment we laid a hand to blade. Please, you've seen more than anyone. You got to have some idea of what it all means and how we make sense of it. Okay, there's a lot of choices here. So it seems like these choices are all kind of philosophical in nature. Different philosophies on the gods, religion, um, kith, and power. 
and there are two that immediately jump out to me. One is the second one, don't rely on custom to drive your faith or you'll make the same mistakes as before. Um, I'm a big fan of that. Uh, I've always thought about like traditions and how it's not a good idea to keep up with the tradition simply because it's tradition. If it's not doing anything else, if it's not harmful or anything, then sure, keep doing those things. But just because something tradition, if it's harmful, doesn't mean tradition is a good reason to keep doing that thing. Uh, so you always have to examine your actions and see how they uh, affect the outside world, people around you, those kinds of things. So that's why I like number two and number seven. And Biartur is a little bit of an extension of myself, I guess. Um, and then the, the other one I like is seven. The Dawn Stars have survived because of the community they formed. You don't need Aethys for that. Um, I don't think I'm going to do that one, although I do like that idea that it's not about the god you follow, it's about the people that you are with. Um, I, I do like that thought, but I don't think a Dawn Star will take kindly to that. So I'm going to I'm gonna stick with that second one. Don't rely on custom to drive your faith, or you'll make the same mistakes as before. And you know what? Since these are interesting responses, let's go through them all before I actually select number two. Uh, we already did two and seven, so one... I can't tell you how to respond. You have to figure this out for yourself. That's just kind of like throwing it on him, um, not taking part, and it's definitely not what he wants to hear. Three says, I don't know what it means, but I trust there's a higher purpose to the God's actions, including Aethys. Um, I do think that. Like, I don't know if higher purpose is the way I would say it, but I believe that Aethys has his reasons for doing what he's doing. Uh, number four says, even gods must answer for their crimes. Aethys is no exception. Um, seems kind of vengeful there, uh, whereas I am just trying to figure out what Aethys is doing. Five, the gods aren't the only means to greater understanding. Together, Kith can achieve much. Just look at Animancy. I like the start of that one, but then we have just look at Animancy. People have mixed feelings on Animancy here, so it's uh, difficult to say that, and I, I, I feel like a Dawnstar would, have, would be reluctant to hear that Animancy is a positive. And then finally, six says, your faith and your way of life have kept your people together through war and famine. Hold on to them. Um, I do like that one, um, but it suggests that they sh that he should keep following Aethys. And I would like to plant the seed that we don't need the gods. Um, that's the the kind of tact I'm taking here. So I'm going to select number two again, which says, don't rely on custom to drive your faith, or you'll make the same mistakes as before. Sounds downright reasonable when you put it that way. With our nods, letting this sink in. I won't keep you, but you've given me a lot to think about. Thank you. He turns away and allows himself to melt into the crowd. So that conversation seemed like it was just a little bit of world building there and maybe a little bit of a chance to role play your character. All right, here's Pitley and we have the Drowner's Long Medicine. Need something. Why don't the children of the Dawn Stars help the Reparo with their food shortage? We tried, but the one away is prize share, meaning anything we would give these people has to go through the palace. I want a term referring to the distribution of wealth. Oh, okay, so if they wanted to give food to the Reparo first, they'd have to give it to the palace and then trust that the palace would give it to them, which is obviously not gonna happen. They've been treating them like garbage for so long. Best I can tell, our food went to the queen's table, assuming it didn't rot in the storehouse first. If the Queen sanctioned more shares for the Reparo, would the Dawnstars donate crops again? Her thin lips worry together, but she nods. That's a question for Solwyn. I'd ask her myself, but I got my hands full here. She's High Priestess at the Temple of Gaon. Tell her Pitley sent you. She'll listen. Probably. Here's your medicine. Her eyes, watery and red, dart between you and the file you hold. She coughs into her fist. That could save an awful lot of sick people. She wipes her hand in the shirt and holds it out to you. Give her the medicine. I could have asked for money there. Not going to do that. 
She takes the bottle from you and uncorks it. A sharp, piney odor escapes. She breathes it in and smiles. That's the stuff, all right. Thank you. That's from me and from the Children of the Dawn Stars. Got a major positive reputation with the Children of the Dawn Stars and the Gullet. We got something called Halgut's Warmth. Um, and then we got some money and some experience. So Halgut's Warmth is a ring that gives us plus one priest restoration power level and two, plus two burn armor reading. Set this ring into the set into this ring as a chunk of stained glass from Halgut's Citadel also known as the Godhammer Citadel. The glass is warm to the touch, given to you, excuse me, given to you by the Aeth Asian priest Pitley for aiding in her mission to care for the afflicted. This ring represents renewal and compassion for the downtrodden. Um, so Halgut Citadel, Godhammer Citadel, that is as just a little reminder there, the Saints War ended at the Godhammer Citadel when St. Widewin was blown up in the Godhammer bomb and St. Widewind died, and it is thought that Aesis died as well, although he has obviously since been reborn. <clears throat> if you'll excuse me, I better start treating the sickest ones. Okay. Uh, we have a couple things to do down here. Um, we haven't figured out a noise problem yet, but we did go down into Delver's Row. Um, so who do I... I need to... Yeah. All right, so hang on a second. Approach Captain Seduzo in the tavern in the gullet about passage for Bia and the children. A row time captain named Seduzo is at a slums tavern. Bia believes Seduzo could take her and the children to Rawatai, but after what happened to Bataro, she's hesitant to approach the woman on her own. I looked for Bataro. Orin and his company of gold pack knights have all booked the berths of Captain Sudo's ship. They're staying in the upper room of the tavern. Perhaps I could talk to them. Bataro hid Dario's money in a corner rubble near the tavern. I spoke with Orin. He seems unwilling to see his berths. Hmm. Let's see if I can find Seduzo again and see if there's any way to move that quest forward. Oh, something was happening. You've caught the eye of someone important. A cloaked figure sidles up to you, hidden behind a raspy whisper and a long, drooping hood. If you're interested in making good pay and a good friend, head to the Narrows at the western end of the gullet. Once you reach the alleys, go right and right again as soon as you can. Then, follow the bend to the left. The bullies guarding the door have a weakness for chewing Svev. You can follow their trail. Her teeth flashed under her hood. Tell them Dario sent for you. And remember your manners. Oh, and that's part of the Cornet's call. Okay. So maybe that's how we get the second... Uh, shell. Uh, it's also telling us how to get to Delver's Row, even though we've already been there. This time we can go the, uh, the front way. Let's first talk to BS, see if she has anything to say. My village was not like this. Why does Queen Onikaza not send the foreigners away? Found Bataro in the old city. He's dead. Of course. I only hoped. She breaks off, shaking her head. It is no matter. Thank you for telling me. How many of you need passage to Rawatai? We are six. Three children, two babes, and me. Does no one else from the cast look after them? Akira. It was so in the village where Bataro and me came from. But here, we are all strangers. No one looks in on the sick or cares for the children. Suggesting that um, the Raparo kind of raised children together, not just as a single mother, father, uh, but as a village, so to speak. Um, did you know Bataro was working for criminals? Of course not. He worked on the docks, I I'm sure of it. I'm a watcher. I read the memory in his soul. Should I tell her this? 
Oh, I am, yeah. She blinks at you in disbelief, her mouth half open. For what do you torment me? He was a good man. As you say. The Overseer looks for a reason to toss us below, too. Such talk will bring him to our doorstep. So I won't tell him that. Can you take a different ship? She shakes her head. Many ships leave from Queen's birth, but the Valians take slaves. She lowers her voice and glances furtively around. They say the Principes smuggle goods in the caverns below, but I cannot trust such people. But the Rauatians have mighty cannons, and a big homeland they abandon for ours. Perhaps there is more room for us there. Oh well. Alright, so no way to move it forward there. Over there. I wonder if that's Bataro's stash. Maybe if I give that to Seduzo. Okay, here's Seduzo. What is your business with me? Bia and the children still need passage out of the city. There's nothing I can do. The passenger quarters have been reserved by a dwarf named Orin. She picks up a stray thread from her smooth, crisp jacket. Why do you bring this to me? You're a merchant, no? I'll pay you to take them. I can take three more in the hold, and no more. Orin and his crew have reserved the berths. That is assuming... You have the coin. She gives you a searching look. The children are small. Surely you can take more. I will already have to abandon crates of cargo to make room for these three. Plus, the food and water they require. Let me think about it. As you say. Alright, let's see what just updated here. Okay, so I can pay... She can take three passengers. All right, so I need to go kick Orin off this boat. Somehow. And I believe the Gold Pact Knights are the Paladin Order that take oaths very seriously. Or maybe... No, no, it's contracts very seriously. Oath are the Oath Binders. Um, <clears throat> they take their um, contracts very seriously. And once they promise they are going to do something, they don't go back on their word. So this might not be easy. What do you require? I'll make you an offer for your berths on Seduzo's ship. A gold-packed knight is bound by his contract, and ours binds us to make all possible haste to Takoa. He squirms and sets his cup down in the exact middle of a water stain, lining the base up at the edges. Booking passage on another ship on such short notice would be most expensive. I can pay you enough to book passage on another ship. He looks up from fidgeting with his cup long enough to give you a doubtful frown. All ships leaving for Rawatai are laden with luminous Adra and other rare goods. Mercenaries, even of our skill, do not rate so highly. Pay a thousand co copper pawns. Consider this me making a contract with you. He freezes, staring at the coins. After a moment, he divides them into four even stacks and nods. So it does. Consider our business concluded. He and the other gold packed knights file out. Okay. So now let's go talk to Seduzo. got that 600 from uh, Bataro's stash that he stole, um, so I only had to pay 400 there, but Seduzo's probably going to ask for more. What is your business with me? Orin won't be traveling with you anymore. She eyes you sus suspiciously. The soldier with her shrugs. That is convenient for you. 
But never mind. If there's trouble, I'm staying out of it. The births are paid for. You can send your friends as long as you promise not to make trouble for me. She glances from side to side, checking to make sure no one's listening. Just do it soon. I don't want any mess you've made to spill onto my decks. She looks at her crew and makes a twirling motion with her finger. Um, so maybe she's thinking we did the, uh, we sent them away with a lie about the Audra mill. <laughs> uh, but that's not what we did. We just paid them, so everything's legit. Adair, I get the feeling you don't like me much. Was it something I said? I think it was something I said. No, it's not, uh... You're not doing anything wrong, exactly. Really? I mean, you tell me if you had a problem, right? If I'd bothered you this whole time? It's nothing personal. I just don't think we need to be talking, is all. Oh. Well. Thanks for clearing that up. Maybe Adair sees in Shodi someone he used to be, so he is hesitant to get to know her. My village was not like this. Why does Queen Onikaza not send the foreigners away? Oh, I'll give her the money. Actually, I spoke with Captain Suzo about passage out of Nekataka. What say, then? Bia listens with cautious hope. The children look on with wide, round eyes. She's agreed to take you all. She is momentarily speechless. Her eyes fill with tears. She drops the reeds as she brushes them away. Our watcher sure is something else, ain't he? The Arnation, you're gonna make me cry myself. May Amira's winds ever blow sweet for you. We will pray always for you in this life and in each to come. She picks up the two infants and hurries the others out the door. All right, task completed. Indeed. But only dirty rags remain in the cribs. Okay, so Bia's gone. Uh, she got passage. And... I think now I want to go to... Let's go to the Sacred Stair first, and then Prince Aruihi. To the Temple of Gone and the Sacred Stair. I'm supposed to speak to Sewin. It is the light that has led you here. She nods. Haley said you may be able to help with the food shortage in the gullet. You did good, helping Peatley with the infected. Anyone half so capable's got my ear. But I won't make you an empty promise. She dips her head, considering. We tried. Shipped some shares for charity. God, it's nearly two years back. Had the means to do some real good. But the guards wouldn't have it. Sent it all to the palace to be shared out. Proper like. Never did see it again. What if I could ensure it would reach the Reparo? Of course. We'd be glad to lend a hand. But how you see our shares reach the Ruparu this time? What makes you think it'll work now when it didn't then? I'll work to gain an audience with the Queen and petition her to allow your charity. All right. You wind up in the good graces of the Kahanga Royals. You get them to see the light. And I'll get you our food. Okay. So now we gotta talk to the queen about that. We might have to do something for her first, but we'll figure that out when we get there. Because I need to go there anyway to talk to Arihi about something from the gullet. Um, let's see if I can find the quest here. Alright, so he wants to hear that the Reparo reached an agreement with a group of pirates. Black market goods are smuggled into Nekataka through a small inlet in the Undercroft. What's more, the ships are guided with the aid of water shaping. 
This is information the prince will want to hear. So, I'm a little nervous telling him about that. I don't want him to take revenge. Hopefully, I can convince him to, instead of taking revenge on the Roparo, to take care of the Roparo. Here, let's speak with Onikaza. Watcher, something on your mind? We should speak about the gullet's food shortage. Does the gullet lack? The seasons play havoc on our crops, I say. She frowns, waving you on. Between the rotten food piles and the scarcity, the gullet barely supports life. If I wanted an emotional opinion, I would go to Periki's overlook. Speak to my brother Aruihi. He handles local concerns while I lose sleep over the archipelago. She beckons toward the exit. Now, with that out of the way, is there nothing else? Farewell. Okay, so now I gotta find Aruihi. He's not in his room. Maybe he's in, like, the throne room? Secrets from the gullet yet? I had other questions. If there's curiosity to be satisfied, Akira, I will help. We should talk about the food shortage in the gullet. Shortage? Are the Raparu not fed the leavings of the Quaru and Mataru? The gullet is in a poor state. There's little enough to go around. Sighing, Prince Arui, he presses his palms together and nods. It is no wonder how Delver's Row won the love of my people, I say, by feeding them when we could not. Find us solutions instead of old problems, I say. The Dawnstars have agreed to offer a share of their crops to Nekataka as long as the bulk of it goes to the Raparu. My sister would call this a test from the gods. It is our role to feed the Raparu, and we do not pass on our duties to outsiders. Aruihi thumbs his chin, nodding. But I am of a different mind. Nothing pleases Ngati like an unlikely solution. And this is what you bring. Akira, then let it be so. He nods, a smile parting his lips. If you have more to say, I am not above listening. He nods, sweeping his hand out. I want to discuss the black market in the gullet. I expect results, Watcher. Have you gotten to the bottom of Delver's Row? The Principi are, are smuggling cargo by the Undercroft. Undercroft? A darker, more fetid layer of Nekataka, I say. 
He cradles his chin in his palm, looking off into the distance. Onikaze and I are the mind and heart of the city, but the bowels, these we cannot reach. At least Delva's row is a stable target. The crown has time to decide the next steps. What do you plan on doing about Delver's row? I learned in the arena never to underestimate an advantage. Sorry, I clicked early there. If you, if he was cut off a little bit. For now, it is enough that I know where they bring in goods. Water shapers were helping the ti pirates bring the ships. I had my suspicions, but I had no wish to see them confirmed. Are we? He blinces, winces, and looks away. When it comes to the dignity of the guild. The crown can compromise nothing. Onikaza will see their leadership disciplined, I say. Say nothing. Onikaza and I both expect more from the guild, I say. She will not be pleased. Oh, he shakes his head and sighs. A major positive representation with the Juana and moderate with, with the Juana. Ikira, but at least you return to me in one piece. You are not the first agent I sent to the gullet. But you are the first to return. Are we? He grins in spite of himself and claps you on the shoulder. I cannot say that I desire to send you to worse places than the gullet, but. But you're going to anyway. Ikira, my apologies. Does the name Ukaizo mean anything to you? The prince's face is impassive, but he seems to be studying yours with close attention to detail. We have read quite a few things about Ukaizo. A lost city, if local fables are to be believed. Fabled? No. History, I say. Ukaizo was the home of the Huana before cataclysm and destruction wiped the island from the dead fire. That is the story. Story or no, I make no secret that we search for Ukaizo. He studies you, allowing his words to sink in. Many of my countrymen also believe that Ukaizo is nothing more than a myth. But there are others who would kill to find such a place if it were real. And kill gladly if but a tenth of the myth was true. Or we he peers at Palagina before turning his attention back to you. Our tribes are spread across many isles, but it is Ukaizo which binds us. Ukaizo and the knowledge that we must return. So I guess the thought is that the Huana at one point at one point called Ukaizo home. Uh, and they have not been able to get back because of all the storms that surround the place since then. To that end, a local cartographer secured a lead. A breadcrumb to a breadcrumb, I say. I sent an expedition to Matari Okozi, one of the Sanctuary Isles. They were to retrieve evidence of our lost homeland. They have yet to return. Sanctuary Isles? They were sites where our ancestors grouped in terms of crisis. Constants in changing seas. You have the cartographer Atepo to thank. He wanders the western shrine if you would know more. The prince makes a dismissive wave toward the door. What makes you think Mataro Okozi contains evidence of Okaizu? The sanctuary isles give comfort and guidance to sailors on the long journey home. I am hoping the island can remember its purpose and return us to the home we lost. How has the island remained hidden all this time? The question for those with years to gather reeds and scribe their thoughts. Or he smooths back his hair and sighs. It might be that someone or something on the island does not wish to be found. In better times than these, I would have been happy to oblige. Shouldn't I expect any resistance? The trading companies would not have thought to look for Matari Okozi, but now they are vultures to carry in. Matario Cozy, okay. I do not doubt that our rivals race for the same thing, all while we fall behind. Are we his size? No further questions? Ikira, then you are ready to depart? I'll keep an eye out. Um... I'll keep an eye out, no promises. Before you go. Are we, he lowers his tone and glances to his left and right. That did seem like too nice a way to end it. <laughs> the expedition. I have reason to believe they will not be returning to Nakataka. Go on. 
We found this at the palace doorstep, cut from the robe of the expedition leader. He reaches into his pocket and draws forth a wad of red-stained bark cloth. One mystery heaped on another, I say. He drags his thumb over the cloth and frowns to himself. Let me see that. I might be able to learn something from it. Nodding, he relinquishes the scrap. A fragment of essence clings to the fabric like a thread woven too tightly to be unraveled. Trees tower above you and ropey vines stretch like tentacles across a marshy ruin. Ruin. It takes all of your strength to trudge through the hip-deep water. You glance over your shoulder, but the women and men of your company aren't there. Then a shape moves off in the distance. You draw your weapon, feeling now more alone than ever. The vision departs, leaving you with a deep pit in your stomach and the phantom sensation that nothing has gone as it should have. The prince regards you expectantly. Nature is restless on the island, but I can guess nothing more. I suspected this, as you say. Take care if you alight on Matari Okozi. My fear is that the island is sanctuary no more. Sighing, Prince Aruihi folds the cloth with reverence. Prepare yourself for a hard voyage northeast of Nekataka. Matari Okozi is nestled in the core of Rokuhu Islands, in the midst of a landmass that resembles a storm, like the fall of Ukaizo locked in time. Aruihi bites his thumbnail and turns away, lost in thought. Watcher, even if Ukaizo is a myth, Motario Kozi is old enough that it may contain some clue about why Aeothis is interested in the dead fire. Okay, so we got a new quest and we completed a few quests as well. We completed trade secrets. We told Prince Arihi Ari about the Undercroft. And we completed helping him. no food for thought. Oh no, he didn't complete food for thought. Now I have to go back to Hanoi. <laughs> okay. So I don't 100% trust the Huana Dead to... Fire's so different than what I'm used to. Well, it must be for you, too. Ah, quite different. Even I am not accustomed to this much sailing. They, uh, they seem to hold the godlike in high regard. Do you ever think about staying? The dukes have liberated me from the burden of making that choice, Adair. Um, uh, sorry, I just wanted to listen to that conversation. Um... I don't totally trust the Huana to keep to their promise, but it's better than nothing here. So we're going to a noise home now. The old man grimaces some attempt at a smile. He inclines his head to you, indicating he's aware of your presence. Oh, I'll tell him this. I found Ulog's body in the narrows. I know he stills for a moment, only moving to blink his black pebble eyes. Then he takes a deep, shuddering breath and exhales all at once. His damp breath smells like bile and illness. It was as I feared, then. Tell me, how did he die? Was it fast, at least? Painless? Should I be honest, or should I lie to him? He was beaten to death. Looked like it went on for a while before he died. The gullet claims another life, then. The old man groans, rubbing his knotty jointed fingers across his eyes. I... I'm sorry you had to see that. It's not right. Thank you for your honesty, Watcher. You are there who will deliver bad news in all its sorry truth. So the right choice. Speak, and I will listen. The Dawn Stars will share their crops, and the Queen will allocate the majority for the gullet. The old man's eyes glisten. I heard of missionaries distributing food throughout the gullet. 
though I did not think it could be true. Not in this lifetime could I have hoped for more. To have garnered our Queen's generosity. I ache to believe it. Never can I thank you enough, Watcher who has the ear of both kith and gods. Always the Raparu will know of your kindness. Should you need refuge within Nekadaka, know that the Raparu will stand by your side. Take care, old man. May Amira's winds ever fill your sails, boy. We will not forget what you have done for us. Okay, so finish that quest. Let's now go to Dario and Delver's Rose. Two rights and then a left, I think. What I need is a soul for my lantern. I say B had did right leaving the gullet. She went and did what she needed. Maybe we can get the other horn. There is not exactly a pleasant guy, I don't think, though. Okay, so um, I think I have gone through all of this, so I'm just kind of going to go through this quickly and not read everything here. So go right, go right, go left. Dario sent a messenger for me. Let me through. Maybe now I can leave easily. The last time that was a pain, but um, maybe that was because I came through the wrong way. Oh, this is a whole different thing. Okay. There's Dario the Lean. A thin, long-limbed man holds a handkerchief in one side and a threaded needle in the other. As you approach, he sets his handiwork aside, and you see an elaborate goldwork pattern embroidered around the edge, the same pattern that adorns his brilliant tunic. You also notice a strange bulk beneath the thin fabric of his trouser legs that runs up from hip to ankle. So he's got a weapon in there? Um, he looks a little like, uh... Why can't I remember his name? Giancarlo Esposito. Uh, Gustavo on Breaking Bad and like a lot of other things too. You make your appearance at last. I had wondered when we might meet, but I must say, I did not expect it to be with a trail of enemies behind you. Um, sounds kind of like him too. Continue. Uh, this is because we have not been good with the Delvers Row criminals. You must forgive the cryptic introduction, but I prefer to remain among the comforts of home. He leans forward with a squeak of leather and a rattle of metal. You see something protruding above his boots, the bottom of a leg brace. Well, ain't you sitting oh. fat and happy in your home while just outside people are starving? He may look like a prince, but he smells like a pirate. Better to be a prince here than a slave out there, no? He dips his head in a mock bow, then he turns back to you. Though these are modest luxuries compared to those at the estate of your friends in Queen's birth. But had I only known there was a watcher in my midst, I would have extended the invitation sooner. I'm just gonna wait. A stone fish with ears. Yes. You are every bit as taciturn as they say. I am thinking we could be grand friends, you and I. You cannot have too many friends in Nekataka. Dario bears his perfect, even teeth in a smile. I'll be real honest, Watcher. I don't think this guy's gonna be a very kind friend to us. And I need only a favor. An insignificant thing for a watcher like you. There is an artifact called the Cornet of Waves, which is currently in the possession of a Juana named Takano. I would like you to liberate it for me. He flutters his slender hands in a way that resembles a bird taking flight. Why do you need a watcher? 
Watchers see what many cannot. Takano is a man of many vanities, as your special gifts will no doubt reveal. His villa is on the eastern edge of Serpent's Crown, just downwind of the palace. He pauses, tensing his fingers. The opportunist I first hired was too bold and found herself ejected from the district. With your genteel manners and unique talents, I am hoping you can avoid such complications and persuade Takano. After all, it would be best to avoid drawing the ire of our Mataru hosts. When you have the cornet, bring it to me. I will pay you well for it, and you will find my favor useful in this part of the city. Do you want to know about the cornet or the hidden temple of Andra that it opened? His brace rattles as he starts forward, mouth agape. Gallarde! You watchers truly are workers of miracles. He claps, and the figure waiting by the door scurries into the narrows. Oh, man. I thought I needed a second... That must have been something else I was thinking of. I thought I needed a second cornet to open something. Oh well, this concludes our business then? He clears his throat and produces a blunderbuss. After a brief, pa brief pause, he whirls around and holds it out to you. Never let it be said that Dario does not pay a fair price. So I actually got positive reputation with Delver's Row there. And I got Kitchen Stove, a blunderbuss. That is, seems like it's wild. Um, like, not accurate. But you can fire more. Harold Tyrant, a dwarf captain of the Valian privateer Karak Ferriato Vielo, learned what's Vielo? Oh, swiftly. Uh, learned well the deadly business of deck to deck combat over his long years of violent plunder. The blunderbuss, his boarding crew's favorite weapon, was well suited to the task of sweeping an enemy deck of opponents, but reloading such a weapon was damnably slow in the heat of combat. Terrell, a capable gunsmith, set forth to improve his own weapon. He needed a firearm that could be loaded quickly. It had to be able to, in his words, fire anything, even the god's damned kitchen stove. In that endeavor, he was successful. The gun he crafted could accommodate just about any type of ammunition so long as it fit down the trump-like barrel. Terrell was known to load nails, forks, and even coins into the gun. In a particularly grisly recollection, after suffering a near-fatal gunshot wound to the face, he's said to have rammed a handful of his own broken teeth into the trusty weapon before shooting the as attacker dead. Terrell, aged, scarred, and battle-weary, eventually retired. Ill-suited to a life ashore, he fell on hard times and was forced to pawn the weapon he saved his life many times over. Both he and the weapon faded into obscurity. I guess it, handed into, it ended up in Dario's hands. Indeed, I would hate for anyone to say that, that Dario does not pay a fair price. He gives you a respectful, strained smile and nods one of his attendants who produces a bag of coin. Got 200 copper. Now, allow us to put the question of money to rest. It is an unseemly topic to linger on. Let's discuss something else. What do you require? I'm not going to give him back his money. So, about the Cornet of Waves. A most agreeable topic. Or so I hope. Oh. What Can't do you ask require? any questions about that. What happened to your legs? A storm, a rash decision, and an accident at sea. One that took my sailing days, but not my skill with a needle. He smiles cryptically. Life in the dead fire is unpredictable. Sometimes it takes you in its jaws only to spit you out onto some new shore. The principe seemed divided. Which side are you on? Why must we speak of sides like squabbling merchants from the republics? He makes a face as if he just smelled something awful. Ah, oh, our merchants squabble. I imagine your pirates do not bother with the squabble and just put a bullet through the head of whoever displeases them. Better to spend lead than waste words, Aimeka. He smiles. 
Once, there were no sides, only principi, a people united by common interest and culture. But as our fame has grown, so have our numbers. Many of these new bloods have no sense of restraint and little regard for our heritage. His long fingers stray to his shining swollenette. Um, this is speaking, we have heard this before, that it was uh, disillusioned Valians that started the Principi, uh, and they had quote unquote honor, uh, but over time it has become, in their point of view, more corrupt with the newer people that weren't necessarily Valian that had joined the ranks. So it seems like there's the old guard and the new guard, and that's who's fighting. I'm just gonna listen to him. But we need them still. The new bloods are Principi too now. And many are inventive in ways the old god is not. So he is annoyed by the new blood, but he sees he sees them as useful. A moment, I almost forgot. He takes the needlework from the table and unfurls it. It looks larger than it initially looked. Bergamblanca. Take it and indulge my vanity. He hands you loving, a lovingly crafted flag. So we got Principe colors. That's a flag we can hang on our ship so that we won't get attacked by Principe. It is not as grand as the sails I once made, but my fingers are ever restless. I'm not gonna hang that though. Just a moment, please. Hope that helps. Excerpts from Sermon of Struggle. Who's this a book about? Oh, that's Magrin. That's the Magrin book. And I read that in the first game. Well, if you insist. Uh-oh. Okay. I'll try my best. It's no trouble. Happy. What's in here? Nothing too special. Cannon is engraved with an emblem of the Royal Dead Fire Company. Okay, hopefully I can just go back, explore the narrows, go to the gullet, go to Delver's Row. Okay, so I can just choose places to go in it, which is extremely helpful. That was annoying to try and navigate through. Okay, what's next? On your brow, Alloth. This, uh, I found myself in a rather perilous situation with a band of Darghouls. Dargles can be real nasty. You're lucky that's all you got to show for it. I certainly gave them worse. Uh, not to boast, of course. Okay. So we have all these character quests. We have the Bardato and Valera. Let's see what's going on with them. of import all right let's try this one since we have Pelagina in our company right now director Castel told me to make contact with Britza a Valian trading company spy working undercover at the Luminous Bathhouse in Pariki's Overlook. She may be able to tell me what she's learned about the smugglers. Um, he is worried about smugglers. Um, off the books meeting between Royal Dead Fire Company official named Quarno and a Principe captain by the name of Tola. So he's worried that the Royal Dead Fire Company and the Principe are working together and he wants us to find some information about that. So let's head to the Luminous Bathhouse in Pariki's Overlook. Oh, we also have to do the Water Shapers Guild quest. I'll probably be... I'll, I'll save that for the next episode. <laughs> Wait, what's the name of the person I'm looking for? Ritsa.
she is. You and I, we have a mutual friend, do we not? She grins widely, tongue pressing pink between her teeth. Just tell me what I need to do. Then I'll say, I'm here at Director Castell's request. Good, good. The tension in her shoulder settles, and she hazards a small smile. A royal dead fire operative, Quarno, and his Principio associate, Tola, will meet tonight to discuss the details of a, a business arrangement. They have bought out the entire first floor for privacy's sake. Even Gunnar, their proprietor, will excuse himself. Only bathhouse attendants will be allowed to remain, to ensure their comfort. You understand? Um, thinking way back to one of the first sessions, we spoke to a um, former bathhouse attendant, and they are known for basically waiting on the people that are in the bathhouse, but ignoring any of the shady dealings that they're doing. And she got in trouble because it seemed like she was listening a little too closely to somebody. Um, so we see why the attendants are the people that are allowed to stay. What can you tell me about Quano? He is a snake in the body of a man. Though he is supposedly the Royal Dead Fire Company's man, he always seems to be working some deal on the side. Anything I should know about Tola? Tola is fond of drink, and her tongue flaps loosely when she has had too much of it. Okay, so need to give Tola alcohol? He is a snake in the body of a man. Though he is supposedly the Royal Dead Fire Company's man, he always seems to be working some deal on the side. So Tola likes alcohol, and Corno seems like he's probably got some other shady dealings that maybe the Royal Dead Fire Company would not be so pleased about. Uh, what do you need me to do? I will disguise you as a bathhouse attendant, so you might observe their meeting. With luck and some cunning, you may be able to discover the details of their special arrangement. You will not be able to take your gear, but do not worry. Should the situation get out of hand, there will be a stash of weapons hidden in one of the changing booths. But I am sure it will not come to that. She smiles broadly. Okay, so bunch going do I have to be unarmed? They will not believe you an attendant if you carry a blade. Her mouth quirks into a playful smile. But do not fear. I would not throw you to the wolves. Remember, should you have need of them, there is a stash of weapons in one of the changing booths. You can't do this yourself. I have had dealings with Tolar in the past, and I am certain she will recognize me. Hence why I have requested assistance from Director Castell, though it pains me to do so. She grimaces and looks away. Um, I'm ready to infiltrate. Actually, I'm going to say I'm not ready so Prepare I can save. Run. We must not let this opportunity pass us by. And then I'll tell her I'm Are ready. Are you ready, Aimiko? Gelarde! Then you will take your disguise, and I shall take your equipment, Ak. Her voice drops to a conspiratorial whisper. Take this rice wine as well. Perhaps you will find use of it, that eh? That would be for Tola. <laughs> oh, we're all in our skitties. Oh, there's Tola. Talk to her first. A boisterous woman with a long sunburned nose motions as you approach. Her eyes droop half closed and the stench of liquor wafts off of her. Ah, what timing. Langin in all this war is making me thirsty. Bow and give her a bottle of rice wine. She drinks deep from the bottle and releases it with a belch and smack of her lips. She regards you through red-rimmed eyes and slowly looks you up and down. I know you. Uh-oh. You're the, uh, the... The, uh, what's it? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's the wine that I'm acquainted with. She laughs to herself. So I have a bad reputation with the Prince P. Uh, it's probably the wine. Tola stares at you unsteadily, her eyes half closed. Give her another bottle of rice wine. I feel like asking would uh, kind of 
give them a little bit of a hint as to what I'm trying to do. I feel like I'm just supposed to wait on them. She grabs a bottle and chugs the entirety of its contents without taking a breath. She sways a bit when she sets the bottle down and gives you a bleary-eyed grin. Has anyone ever told you you're great? Because you are really great. You should ditch this stupid bathhouse. Join my crew. I just got a bunch of fancy new cannons from Quano. We'll be the terrors of the dead fire. He'll be fun. Still not going to ask, even though I do want to know what they plan to do with all that firepower. At least we know that the cannons are there. What would happen if I asked her that? I'm just going to bow and leave. Um, so we can report to Director Castle, but let's see what Corno has to say. Quano leans against the wall of the bath and regards you skeptically. He wrinkles his nose and grimaces. The golden torque around his neck and gemstones and his ears glimmer in the low light. If I grow hungry or thirsty, I will call for you. Until such a time, leave me in peace. As you wish. Alright. Might be a bad idea, but I'm going to see what she wants to do with that firepower. My favorite... I'm gonna blow up some Valian trading company ships and take their luminous Ardra. Shh, shh, shh. Don't, don't, don't tell anyone. It's a secret. Her words run together in a drunken slurry. Anything else I can get for you? No. I've already, already had too much. Okay, so... I think we... I think we learned what we need, what we came here to do. Report to Director Castle once you've learned what you can. And that's probably where my stuff is hidden. Still out here. Oh, okay. Okay, phew. Okay. So I've learned that she's planning on raiding a Valian Trading Company convoy and that she got a bunch of cannons from Quarno. Um, okay, but I think we will finish that up in the next session rather than now because we're getting close. I mean, I think we're getting long enough. Like I said, um, there was a long gap in between my two recordings here. But Anyway, um, thank you as always for joining me. This time we uh, spent a little time in Nekataka. We finally finished up some of these quests. We got some food down to the gullet. We spoke with Dario. We talked to Prince Arihi. Uh, so that's all well and good. And we will continue our exploration. Um, well, not exploration anymore, but our finishing up of quests in Nekataka next time. Uh, we'll talk to Director Castle and maybe we'll even go to the Water Shapers Guild and figure out what's going on there for Queen Onakaza. But once again, thanks as always for joining me. Please let me know if you have any questions, comments, clarifications, those kinds of things. And I hope to see you next time for more sentences and paragraphs. Bye, everybody.